Hey, out there in internet land, ladies and gentlemen, this is your friend Charlie Hunter with the Reasonably Fine Art Talk. It's a joy to have you with us today, the day before Thanksgiving. We may be, a, this may be like a few seconds late, but for a very, very good reason. My beloved, the awesome Betty Sue, who pulls all the technological strings behind the scenes here. Well, not here. I'm up in Vermont. She's down in Austin, Texas. But behind the scenes here on in Internet land, she was off getting her booster shot. So Betty Sue is boosted. I'm boosted. Betty Sue's boosted. You boosted, Terry? I'm scheduled. You're scheduled. Okay. Yep. All right. And our guest today is the utterly awesome uh, California-based artist, Mr. Terry Mura. Terry, it's a joy to have you with us. How are you? Great. Thank you for having me. This is going to be fun. Yeah. Now, Terry, where did you and I first meet? Was it at, um, I believe it was at Sonoma Plein Air I, I in 2015? So. Yeah. yeah. If, I, if I met you or if I saw you anywhere before that, I don't, I don't think I talked to you. <laughs> That's right. I, I, you, you may not know this, ladies and gentlemen, but Terry is a very dark very dark human being. He likes to take pictures of how did this come about, Terry? How how did <laughs> how why do you take pictures of all of us artists who are a very convivial and happy lot? You yeah. you ask us all to look miserable and then you take pictures of us looking miserable. Well, I think the first ones were just I wasn't trying to take miserable people. <laughs> pictures of miserable people it's just uh you know probably one of these plein air shows when things weren't going maybe sonoma or something it was raining everybody was kind of like unhappy <laughs> and, and i just you know had nothing else to do you know can't paint in the rain so I was just taking picture of people and those turned out to be uh <laughs> more interesting to look at than just typical you know happy right. shots so I, I kept it, doing those. It's really yeah. fun. It's really fun because there are these people who just, you know, yeah, are very, very cool. cheerful people. And then the pictures come. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good stuff. So tell us a little about uh, about the, your evolution, your journey as you, you started in commercial illustration. You, you were born, you were you're from California and you went to New York and were quite mm -hmm. successful. Well, I was born in Coast. Japan. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, he froze. You You freeze and you unfreeze. Yeah. You keep going, Terry. Born in Japan, emigrated to California. A little bit. So so how did you... Um, okay, go ahead. I was born in Japan. Okay, so I got to California. Um, my father's work. Through, um, he was working for Sony at the time, and uh, and uh, we came, or uh, the family came to San Diego. Moved to San Diego. Can you hear me? You're freezing. You just keep. You just keep. Just brave through it. Just plug, yeah. plow through it. Okay. <laughs> so 1975, we came to. America, and I was 11 years old then. Um, went through public um, high school in San Diego area, Escondido to be precise, um, and then went off to college. I was a computer science major first, UC Irvine, um, and eventually that didn't quite pan out, or I, 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 I couldn't keep up, I guess. <laughs> Um, so switched to art, went to Long Beach State for a couple of years, and then I discovered Art Center uh, in Pasadena, a great art school. So I had to go over there. And uh, after that, uh, moved out to uh, New York City to pay my dues and worked as a freelance illustrator, editorial, uh, magazines, book jackets, that sort of thing um, for many years. And eventually we returned to uh, California when my wife 
became pregnant with our first. And, and during that time, uh, around then is when I started considering uh, painting as a career rather than illustration. I was doing Photoshop by then, digital um, editorial kind of stuff. But I could see the end coming, um, you know, when this computer programs become more sophisticated and crappy illustrations are popping up because they're just using Photoshop filters and whatnot. And, you know, stock illustration industries like blossoming and and I could see I could see the end coming. So I said, well, I got to get out now <laughs> and I want to do some painting instead. So I was just doing that. And there was a 10 year transition between being a full-time illustrator and full-time painter. And slowly I just um, took less and less work as an illustrator and tried to get myself into galleries and things like that during that time. Right, and now you do a mix yeah. of, of events and gallery work. And then you also kind of run a, a atelier or an art a, a art program of, of some sort. Um, well, I teach at, at my studio and I do workshops like um, many of our friends and I do plenary events. Um, yeah, so it's kind of a mixture of those things. And I, I show in galleries as well. And are you you're in Sacramento now? Is it? Yeah, Sacramento. Um, well, just outside of Sacramento, okay. but a little bit inland. Yeah. You're not. You're not a coastal Barrels. dweller. Okay. So let's let's yeah. take a little tour. Not so on the not on the coast. coast. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we got a little gap going here, time wise. I'll just I'll shut up for a minute and let things catch up when when and when I when and Terry can then expound. But let's take a little tour through the magnificence that is Terry Mura. Um, let's start with something that I think kind of exemplifies the Mura, um, the Mura Gestalt, which is that it's it's dark, it's humorous, it's very very skillful, and it has a lot of lost and found edges. So tell us a little about about this and about how you go about uh, creating creating images. Um, well, I, I do a lot of different things. I, I don't have a set way of doing things because I tend to get uh, bored um, if I keep doing the same thing. So I, I, I'm always trying to find other ways to kind of get me out of a, my comfort zone, so to speak. And this was an experiment in the object or the, the subject matter was kind of irrelevant. It's I was just trying to figure out how to work with slick surfaces because um, I'm usually working on linen and stuff like that. And so this was like, um, I don't know what it was. It was a very sanded, smooth gesso or something like that. And I said, well, I'm going to learn how to do this. Um, so I just set up my skull and put, put a lemon on it. And <laughs> there you go. And uh, But lost and found edges, uh, those were... Uh, uh, that that's kind of a came from illustration studying illustration a lot of uh 60s and 70s uh, illustrators would have very graphic styles where shadows are all there's no edges between you know the shadows are like melted together and i thought that was pretty cool and this was it's uh, you know it's just um, you know, in school, I was looking at like Bernie Fuchs and people like that. Um, and I was, I remember a light bulb moment. I said, well, well, there's nothing in the shadows. It's just flat and there's no detail whatsoever. And this looks great. And so I said, well, that's less work. <laughs> so that was my original motivation was because I my deadlines were tight. And say, right. well, if I don't have to paint stuff in the shadows, that, that, that'd be pretty cool. So that's that's kind of where it started. And then, um, of course, um, as I got to um, know more about picture making and composition, whatnot, and narrative things, and I, I was very intrigued with the idea of uh, saying less or saying more with less. 
less mm -hmm. is more, whatever. Yeah. So right. well, now, that, now, I, people for our viewers here, um, both you and I have have a great uh, appreciation for some of the great illustrators. You you know a lot more than I do. But what would be a few names of consummate illustrators that you would suggest people who have an interest in representational art take a look at? Obviously, Bernie Fuchs. Obviously, W. Yeah. W. Wyeth. Uh, fill mm -hmm. us in in between those two. <laughs> well, be between Wyeth and when yeah. Bernie Fuchs, <laughs> that's a big, yeah, I, well, you know, I, throughout the, uh, you know, when, whatever I'm interested in, I, it goes, it's all over the map, but um, I, I particularly like Bernie Fuchs' generation, David Grove um, being one, um, uh, Robert Andrew Parker, I love his work. Um, let's see. God, I'm so bad with names and dates and stuff. Okay. Um, Dean Cornwell, I studied extensively. I just kind of tried to copy his, but that's not for lost edges. That's for more, more for construction and composition is what I was looking for in Cornwell. Um, uh, that general. Uh, that's good. That's uh, fine. That's that's like four names that. Uh, yeah. You know, Robert Heindel. Robert Heindel. Heind Heindel. Heindel. How do you spell Heindel. it? H-E-I-N-D-E-L. All right. Someone for me to learn about. Um, but yeah. And you I mean, see the resemblance or the influence there. Now, one of the things I think is might figure about this, this piece is that for you, it was an exercise in uh, mm -hmm. working with a, a, new, a new surface. But the... Yes the nominal subject matter that you use, and this is something I feel is a through line in your work. You, you choose kind of enigmatic, the nominal mm. subject matter itself has a certain enigma to it. And I think that implies a narrative to a much greater mm -hmm. degree than if you had a vase of flowers. There's nothing wrong with florals. It's just, mm -hmm. I really like the enigma of skull and orange slice or lemon slice or whatever it is. But, um, you know, like, why is there a lemon slice balanced on a skull? You know, is it, is it, a, I was meditation? Is it a meditation uh. between the solidity of bone and the translucency of, uh, of, of, of the, the flesh of the fruit of the, of the fruit um, and that makes you think about how the skull is the, the container for the brain. I mean, there, there are all these implied, um, mm -hmm. there's, there's an implied comparison going yeah. on. Um, yeah. And I just think that's really neat. Yeah. And I think because I don't put any, a uh, lot of information and I don't spell things out, that's on purpose so that the, uh, you know, the, it, it's different for every viewer what they get, what meaning they they find in mm -hmm. images like this. Um, so yeah, I, I I try not to spell stuff out too much. Yeah, I think I think it, it, it one of the light bulb moments for me was realizing that by not supplying all the information, mm -hmm. it it. Can, it, it strangely makes things appear more photographic. I mean, mm -hmm. not only does it save time that you can, <laughs> you can have big shadowy areas, and it's graphic. It, it saves time. It's graphically interesting, and it makes things more haunted. Uh, yeah. It's like spray can of hauntedness. Yeah. Um, and 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 those watching today do keep a keep an eye on how Terry uses big areas of negative and positive space. That to me is, is, he's a real master of that. Let's have the next slide, Betty Sue. You do a lot, a lot of, of figure studies mm -hmm. and both from life and then you do a lot that are uh, construction from, from your own mind, from work you've done before, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. So what was this one? Is this, is this an actual human or is this a figment oh, yeah. of your imagination? <laughs> well, 
most of these figure paintings that I do I uh, use drawings, figure drawings that I did from life as reference. So when I'm painting the figure, I'm only using the drawing as reference. The model is long gone. So when I'm doing the drawings, those are very short drawings, like five, seven minute drawings, only has the, uh, the gestural information and also the la shadow pattern information. There is no value information in the drawing. It's just the pattern where the shadow edges are and the gesture. And that's all I have to work from so that I'm not like looking at a model or a photo and um, that kind of, you know, working from my, if my reference has a lot of information, I tend to put more information and, uh, you know, mm -hmm. kind of get stuck there. So in, in this way, the way I'm working, and I have very little information in the reference, so I have to make up the rest or not put it in or figure out a way to make it look interesting, look good without putting in all that information. Because I don't want to put false information. Um, so what I put in there um, just, just depends on what I'm capable of without the re reference. Right. Well, it, 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 I think that... I, again, I, I'm struck with how that similar that is to, to things that I've found work well for me is yeah. I do a lot of studio work from my drawings, from, from black mm -hmm. and white 20 minute sketches. I'll mm -hmm. go in and do a, you know, a, a fully chromatic studio piece from that. And it, it's very freeing not to work. Oh, yeah. I find that the, 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 the people who work from, you know, iPads or large monitors, they have my respect because I would get so tight from that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh. I find that to be true. And, and me I mean, too. This has just the beauty. I mean, to by not having that exact reference in front of you, you, you have the beautiful line of her back. And then on the buttock, you, you, you have that, slur of mm. between light and dark and to give yourself permission to do that as an artist is really tough because we, we want to follow the rules and yeah. if, we, if we're looking at the actual human we'd probably say her buttock does not slur at that moment <laughs> slurring buttock <laughs> yeah but oh yeah. i just this this has this has such uh it's such beauty and 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 rhythm to uh, the way the light and the dark interplay, and then you lose you lose like the the her knee, which mm -hmm. of course in reality would not be if we right. were staring at the real model that would be very much in focus. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's I think it's just a gorgeous way of looking. Right. Love it. Thank you. Yeah. We love the painterly quality of, of your work. So let's now look at those those quick sketches. Oh, yeah. So this is typical of like your little five minute uh, or two or three minute gestural drawings? Yes. Well, these are probably two minutes because with the twos, I usually don't get to the shadow patterns. With fives, I get to the shadow patterns. So yeah, oh. these are just much quicker. And I can't use these for the paintings because there is no shadow pattern information. Ah, uh, okay. So this is just getting the, the, the form. Yeah, just warming up to it. Right. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, I've let you down. I've let you down because I did a little editing of, I took out some extra images that Terry had supplied and the next image was of the figures with some value in them. So just imagine some <laughs> headphones in there. <laughs> You'll have a pretty good idea of what we just left out. But look at, ladies and gentlemen, look at the look at the fluidity of that line. Um, ah, that is just beautiful, beautiful uh, line work. The way you're you're that that's a Conte crayon. He, um, yeah, it's it's well, it's what is it? Uh, Stabilo Carbothello pencil. Carbothello, and yeah. It. What is the point on that? Is it like a carpenter's pencil? Well, it's just like a, a fat pencil. It's like a red pencil. It, it, it's a soft lead 
um it's not very waxy it's pastel pencil okay. i guess okay yeah. but it's it's pretty soft though because it allows you to get yeah. those yeah and the softness um you know it's a lead is pretty soft if i'm using a regular general's charcoal pencil i use a 6b you and, know, uh, you do. see yeah. when i i use a extra hard general <laughs> Because yeah. I, I don't want to get, I find I'm too easily seduced by the beauty of the pressure of the line. Uh -huh. And I get, I get off in the weeds about that. Instead, I will, I will, I will look at your gorgeous work and realize I don't have to do it because, uh, because you do it so well. That's mm -hmm. the, one of the beauties of uh, collecting art, ladies and gentlemen, is you can let other people do the stuff that you love that's really hard to do. And Terry actually is one of the few artists who I have collected multiple pieces. Uh, yes, of. thank you very much. You're, you're very welcome. It's time for you <laughs> to step up. Uh, next slide, please, Betty Sue. Now, you also do a bunch of, uh, of, of landscape studies, and you do mm -hmm. a lot of landscape work. These mm -hmm. are fairly recent, I believe, that are, um, are, are gouache. Gouache, yes. Yeah, tell us about this exploration. Um, well, you know, the gouache is, I've, I've used gouache off and on for many years since school, but I never really sat down and tried to figure it out to the point where I could um, control it enough to be useful until just recently. During COVID, um, during the pandemic, I, I had to stop doing the figure sessions at the studio. So, you know, I said, well, I'll, I'll use this time to explore other things. And gouache was uh, one of those things. And these are in a moleskin um, uh, sketchbook. And uh, I, I did these from the driver's seat of my car. And that's one th great thing about the gouache is its port portability. Um, you can do it anywhere, really. And, and I have a kit in my in my car at all times so i could just park my car in a supermarket you know when i go shopping and, and then before I, I actually go into the store i might do a, a couple of these sketches um so all these are done from a parking lot hmm. uh, in my driver's seat nice about uh painting or drawing in the car is that you've is that the steering wheel is a really nice oh yeah stable drawing surface uh-huh yeah and in, in Sacramento, especially in the summer, it gets super hot and you can't go out and do plein air, uh, or I can't anyway, I'm too much of a wimp. Um, and, and so sitting in the car, you know, I got the air conditioning on, I got my coffee, you got music, it's great. You can do it anywhere. <laughs> now, now, one thing you can't get with gouache, you can't really get luminosity in your shadows. Mm -hmm. um, and how did you how do you feel about the medium itself i love the i love the fact that it, it you can be use it so opaquely um because you can keep correcting on on top of mistakes just keep layering on top and and, and it's and obviously these are just little sketches i'm just doing for fun and practice and i'm not you know trying to create a finished painting um well composed or otherwise so uh the the medium the opacity and and the quick drying aspect of it is great uh it mimics very well uh what i try to do with oils um in in the way i work on a on a, the shapes and things so i don't a lot of times I don't pre-draw anything. I just jump right in and, and shape things out with my brush and it doesn't get muddy because it's already dry. You know, it's wet on dry. And if you use uh, enough paint, it's very opaque and you can cover up any mistakes very quickly. Hmm. It, I, I, I've been very intimidated by it. Um, I, uh -huh. I keep it. It's like, it's like I feel like Gatsby uh, out on the end of the, the pier, staring at daisies, the green light of, across the harbor. It's uh, it gouaches. It feels just uh, uh, an unattainable uh, 
but I, I, I really should sit down with it, I'm sure. Um, but now it's very different. I would imagine it's, it would be very different from the way if you try to use it like you use your medium, it wouldn't work too well. No, yeah, I would, it's I would a different, try. different mentality. You got to yeah. think opaquely. Yeah. Yeah, I, I know, but but I, I I've, I've that's part of the fun of, of when you, yeah. you of working with a new medium is that it does force you to not mm -hmm. just rely on the, the tricks that you already know. Now, right. Candace was wondering what size this notebook page was. Um, hang on, right here. It's it's one of these, just the regular. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh man, I would love to look at those. You should publish one of those just as a little privately published book. Yeah. <laughs> no, but, um, uh, so, yeah, this regular says, I don't know what this is, six by nine or something. I don't know. Yeah, six yeah. by nine, it looks like. Yeah. Um, did you do you prep the page in any way or are you just right on the right on the page? It's right on the page. I don't have anything on there. Um, sometimes I'll, I'll start with a yellow ochre or warm wash, but that's it. Um, no gesso or anything. Cool. Beautiful stuff. Let's go to the next one, Betty Sue. And this is this next one is Door County. It's mm -hmm. based on Door County. Um, mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, I had the great good fortune of uh, Terry and Betty Sue and I painted out here. Uh, it's a wonderful corner in Door County because there is absolutely no traffic. And I, I painted there last year, and I actually sent you a text saying, uh, "Yes, <laughs> you know, I'm thinking of you." Um, but the, the, one of the things that's fascinating to me about your process, and I noticed this also in uh, December 2019, we did a uh, a week long get together here in Vermont, which was Terry, Doug Fryer, John Lasseter, Patrick Lee, and myself. Was that yeah, that was that was all. Um, yeah. And we just painted. We didn't paint for anything. It was just a bunch of just because when you're doing a competition, you've got other stuff on your mind. This was just a week of getting the paint together. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I thought is fascinating about you is, is how you and Doug really will take the landscape as a suggestion and then build your painting. This is recognizably that spot in mm -hmm. Door County, but it is very different mm -hmm. arrangement of the trees. And you know, you've, you've, you've taken out a bunch of trees, you've changed where, yeah. uh, you know, what's going on. Your process to me, I, to have that kind of confidence of, I need to remove this, I need to put this in. Talk a little about that. Uh, yes, I, I always find um, the what I can actually see out there when I'm painting in plein air. It's never perfect, you know. It's it, there's always stuff there that I don't want to paint, or it's in the wrong place, or um, and originally maybe the the only thing I did was move a telephone pole or something. But once you move a telephone pole, is it and realize that's okay. You know, remove a trash can. That's okay. So, well, maybe I can remove this tree or move that over a little bit or, you know. <laughs> I think it, that it, it becomes easier. And then it's like once you give yourself permission and then it's like, oh, okay, I'll, I'll re-landscape this. I, you actually saw an earlier version of this while we were there. And I, I was asking, it's like, does this look fussy? And, and you're like, yeah. <laughs> so, and but um, I do a lot of um, plein air. Well, I don't paint plein air a whole lot in, anymore, but I used to. And but what I found very um, helpful is to not after you get it going, after maybe even 80, 90 percent done, maybe 40, 50 percent done, but at some point. Turn it around, turn the easel around, or go somewhere else and just just have a conversation with dialogue with the painting only without looking at the it's the same thing with my figurative things, because I, you know, like only using a drawing mm -hmm. as a reference and not actually seeing the model or photo. 
Um, and then you start to see compositional issues very clearly uh, mm. because right. you're not, you know, being a slave to what you're seeing. Right. You're seeing compositional issues because you are viewing just the composition as opposed mm -hmm. to the, yeah. the real thing. And yeah. It's hard looking, to do. Yeah. When, when, you're, when you're actually seeing the <laughs> there. Yeah, I think it'd be extremely hard to do because it, 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 my clumsy metaphor for it when I'm teaching is when people leave out large things, I say, remember, it is like lying, that you have mm -hmm. to remember each lie to keep the fiction going. You know, mm -hmm. you can't, if you move that trash can out of there, you no longer have the reference of, you know, the proportional reference mm -hmm. of that that trash can gave you. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, that's why that's why it makes sense to me that that you would do this kind of radical reworking when not actually looking at the thing. Right. Um, now, one of the things I think is really interesting in this uh, that I'm noticing right now is you've got this kind of hazy atmospheric thing going, mm -hmm. but then you do some very deliberate, hard edges that are just kind of pasted in there. And the first <laughs> one that my eye goes to is the roof line of the house against the yeah. tree. Yeah, exactly. Then I start noticing others that you're you're putting in like like a master uh it just there are these little slashes that you've got going in there. And mm -hmm. in the foreground, that foreground line of the road before it dips down. You, you've got that bright, the bright green on the right, and then that sharp line, and then the 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 the, the road color against the green on the left. All that is very very sharp, which allows the beautiful atmospheric haziness to to come up by by just by contrast. Mm -hmm. Nice work, Terry. Thank you. God, I hate you. Next, next slide. <laughs> Don't worry, I hate you too. Okay. Now this is, I can hate Terry for a whole other reason on this one. I believe you painted this one at the plein air in Hawaii. Yes. Yeah. So talk, talk, this one has a, this one uses color notes. Um, well, I guess all your, a lot of your stuff, your yeah. colorful stuff does, but I really notice, I guess, because of that red roof and that blue note kind of in the center. Mm -hmm. um, but but uh, tell us a little about this. Uh, well, this was in Maui and uh, it's plein air. During, during the plein air event, I, I painted this. Um, let's see. Well, as far as uh, technical kind of things, um, it's not exactly well it's not close to the colors i was seeing um i organized it i strategized this as a tonal painting of a blue green a blue green tonal painting um so basically it's a blue green tonal painting with a little bit of other color in there so if you take out the red, if you take out the, the tan of the road in the fence on the right, it's just a blue-green tonal paint. Yeah. It's monochromatic with a little variation here and there. Um, nice. and, and you don't need a whole lot, you know, um, to make it look monochromatic but not monotonous, maybe. Uh -huh. And I can push the blues in here in the sky and the, the palm tree because it's analogous to the blue green and it wouldn't it wouldn't get out of harmony it can't and uh so the smaller parts like red roof on the left is just very small the color accents are very small if i use a bigger shape to do color a big color then uh it would kind of get fragmented and out of harmony and the the tan thing on the road is it's actually paved road but i, I decided to make it kind of a dirt looking um that works okay because it's it's not very saturated you know the the hue direction is different from blue green but i'm keeping it closer to a gray mm -hmm. so that that's and, how this is structured and you you get away with having that the red roof on the left i think 
by balancing it with the dots of red on the right, and, mm -hmm. and the, the you take the the roseate gray of the road and go to kind of a more of an ochre with the, mm -hmm. the fence on the right. So that balances the, yeah. the red, uh, yeah. and that's really necessary. If you didn't have those that counterpoint, mm -hmm. that red would be a problem. I think. Yeah, I yeah I would agree with that. And these red, the red roof also doesn't stand out because the value contrast isn't, you know, right. too much. Right. And that's, yeah, that's very important that the value contrast is not, uh, you've got to keep that down. Sherbino, right. you want to join us for a moment? Come on. No, no, wants to sniff my socks. Um, all right. Let's have the next one, Betty Sue. Uh, now, oh, I also, this, this, that, this one reminds me also, you do use the, um, narrative device of the solitary figure because there was a solitary figure in the middle of that uh mm -hmm. of the street on that last one but this one uh you've actually got two well three solitary figures uh because they're, mm -hmm. they're they don't seem to be relating to one another very much right uh, but and this reminds me a lot of the work of Buck, bucknell bucknell is that his bunkle name? Bunk. richard bunkle yeah yeah He's the guy that taught me how to paint. So, <laughs> did he? You studied with him? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah he, he 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 was. Uh, I mean, literally, he taught me how to paint. Well, so. he he was a magnificent artist. He died very very young, right, yeah. of Lou Gehrig's disease, mm -hmm. and was actually the the subject of a touched by an angel television show. Exactly uh, right. Yeah, but. Uh, Ended up tying brushes to his hands so he could still paint and stuff. Yeah, yeah, so, very sad. Amazing. But anyway, let's let us talk about his legacy uh, in this, this magnificent work of yours. What scale is this one, Terry? Uh, probably thirty-six by thirty-six or forty-two or something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is very much influenced by Richard's work. Um, I here too. I mean, um, the structure is the same as the Hawaii plein air piece, except it's just a monochromatic ochre brown thing with a little bit of red in it, um, color wise. Uh, and also, uh, this is several years ago. And uh, this when you're doing a street scene or, or a cityscape, this is a facade, you know, it's a facade. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's very little perspective drawing in it, which allows me to just focus on flat shapes, makes it easier to push paint around um, for abstraction and looking for textures um, because the strokes aren't going to affect a sense of depth. Mm -hmm. And it's not going to get out of whack. You know, if you if you had it like a building corner or something in two point, one point perspective, then I have to, you know, be more careful with the how I push the paint around because the direction of the strokes, et cetera, is going to affect a lot more. And in a sense of depth, a sense of uh, correct perspective, those things come into play. But in a facade, it's flat. Everything's flat, and uh, you know, there's very little um, perspective issues happening. But there still is huge depth in this. Your shadow areas. Uh, oh yeah, are 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 chasms. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, that's the, that center passage where it goes from the left shadowy area mm -hmm. to the window on the right, where you've got the the shadow cast by the awning. Mm -hmm. of, so the red transitioning to the brown of the shadow line, and then the ochre of the mm -hmm. of the of the ground floor. That's that is such a that's again your sharpness against what is a, a lot of very painterly moving of paint around and the rest of it. It's yeah. it's, it's it's fascinating, fascinating uh, display of of mastery of paint movement in this. I think. Yeah. Well, thank you. And but you know, it's like I'm discovering those kinds of things as I'm painting. You know, it's not like I, I'm gonna do it this way. Uh, there's no like that that level of planning in the beginning and then I, I just 
sometimes right. I it, it's like stumbling on it and say, hey, this looks cool. I'll keep it, you know? Yeah, no, it's it's like, uh, you know, it's it's like the goldfish in a little plastic castle. It's a surprise every time when you, 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 you one may use these techniques multiple times, but if you're, mm -hmm. if you're painting honestly, it seems to me, you aren't saying, aha, I'm going to use this technique to make a, to make a, a painting that, that mm -hmm. will be completed. You're trying right. to figure out the best solution to the problem mm -hmm. at hand. Mm -hmm. And if you're, if you're not using the shtick, then mm -hmm. it, is a discovery each time. Oh, this yeah. is the best way to get there. Yeah. So. Yeah. It keeps it interesting. Yeah. And that's a good point, Sandy, that the lettering doesn't get in the way of the values. A lot of times when people do signage, they get mm -hmm. so obsessive about the signage or try to make it so precise that it mm -hmm. overwhelms the painting. This, you, you keep this, the lettering kind of, um, kind of painterly uh, mm -hmm. and you keep the values real close um you know it's it's integrated this, especially when you're using sharp edges for shapes um you have to kind of well I, I only speak for myself but integrate the shapes um adjacent shapes otherwise they just stick out you know or just looks pasted on and stuff so if i'm painting something like this i would have that background signage the white part painted and then i'll put the red on there and try to do the best I can with the signage. But then I'll um, come back with the, the surrounding color and then go right on top of it, maybe obliterate the whole thing or partially, and then put the red back in again. You know, just scraping and redoing, scraping and redoing that it gets um, integrated that way. Yeah, and, and, so. and you and Fryer do that a lot, both of you uh -huh. seem very unafraid. I'm such a wuss. I get a portion I like, and I'm like, I don't want to touch that again. But yeah, uh, beautiful, beautiful. The light on the shoulder of the, the 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 feller under the Sam's. Yeah, that that's that's a nice narrative touch as well. Beautiful work, Terry. Beautiful work. Let's take a look at the next one. Now, these this tell us about these these pure monochromatic ones. Okay, so this is my current series, and uh, they're black and white, and they're much bigger. These are, this one is probably like 30 by 60 or something. And this, um, I'm, I've been doing these black and white, big, bigger cityscape paintings um, for the last several months. And this came out of the, the reflection and isolation imposed by the pandemic. And, you know, I think many of us had to kind of reevaluate what we were doing. And, and in, in my case, I started to think about uh, the notion of authenticity. What is it? You know, and I can't articulate it, but I, I kind of get a sense of it's like what I've been doing has become before up to this point. It's like I, I can do these figurative things. I can do these city paintings. Um, but it was kind of getting too predictable for me. Um, even the random look, looking notes were not really random. It, it just, I could do them. Um, and so I needed to get myself out of the comfort zone once again. And so I said, okay, I'm going to use a different surface. This is like gesso surface. I'm going to use uh, just black and white. And I, I want to do something more immediate from, you know, from here. And so these, this series, is, it's entirely made up. Um, no reference, no photo, no drawing. It's, in fact, the, the very first marks I make on these is uh, big panels. It looks like a bad Franz Klein painting. And that's where I start. Mm -hmm. um, and then like a, one of the blobs look like a car or something, right? It's like a shape of a a blobby car I said, okay that's a car i'm gonna put a car right there and then i go from there constructing using that as a reference point now would you work would you then look at a picture of a car or are you still no, working no entirely? this is entirely how yeah. the hell do you do that i try to do that i try i tried i do my bad <laughs> and i say that's a car 
And then partway through, I said, well, maybe it's not a car. Maybe it's a grain elevator. And uh -huh. I had it before oh, yeah. Horizon Lines. It yeah. Yeah. No, no, exactly. That's exactly the process and the experience. But, you know, like, once again, it's all in shadows. Like if you back light, everything is just a silhouette and a car that's not a three quarter view, but just looking um, frontal or from the behind is just a couple of streaks of rectangles, basically. Yeah. There's nothing more to it. Oh, it's, it's, it's amazing to me because I look at the, the light on the, the woman's head, the, the figure on the right, the dominant figure on the right. And you're not even working from a, not working from a photo, getting something that looks, I've seen that. I've seen that. I've, I've walked down that sidewalk behind that person. You know, uh -huh. it's that it's, it's, it's amazing. It's, I, I doff my hat to you if I was <laughs> Let's look at one more. Let's look at one more, Terry. Betty Sue, we have the final image. Is this another part of that there series? Oh, yes. And this was just, I was messing around and in the top right quadrant, that's a 12 by 16. These are four 12 by 16 panels. And um, that was, it started with just that. And um, I just kept adding panels because I thought it might be kind of interesting. Um, and just playing with it, you know? And this is acrylic. And I have a pot of black paint and a pot of white paint and a, a two-inch brush and a. And yeah, once work, again, working with big enough brushes is that's really important when working large. Yes. Yeah. Found. Yeah, I think um, so. But boy, this again, um, you know, just just this this to me is a fascinating uh, meld of. American illustration tradition, mm. and I I do see Franz Klein, you know, yep. <laughs> just in a, anybody watching this who did, is not familiar with the abstract painter Franz Klein, you could do far worse than to go down that rabbit hole for a while. <laughs> I just I love I love but the the calligraphic and painterly nature of this and how the figures emerge and disappear back in they emerge from the field and they disappear back into the field mm -hmm. what, what you do really it, it, one of the things that i aspire to is to try to make paintings that hover at the edge of chaos and yet you can still discern kind of a melody mm -hmm. uh, even though there's a lot of noise so like electronic mm -hmm. feedback where you can still hear the melody being played and my metaphor for that is Jimi Hendrix's Star Spangled Banner, where uh -huh. it's you know, just noise and then the melody tears through. And I just think you're doing this. You're you're right on that edge between abstraction and reality. And to me, it's it's just uh, inspiring work. I think you're an incredible oh. painter, Terry. <laughs> Thanks. You're doing that too. I try to. Oh yeah. You gotta do yeah. something. Um, now, now, if, if people are, if people that well, that, that quote comes from a, a tourist attraction on Route 66, where there are a bunch of dinosaurs and the dinosaurs mm -hmm. are all eating mannequins, and the feller yeah. whose tourist attraction uh, it was was asked, "Why are the dinosaurs eating mannequins?" He said, "Well, I got to be eating something." <laughs> so. Anyway, anyway, if if you do. Um, do you do any online workshops or are your is your stuff all in person? Well, I was teaching uh, online classes for a while. I kind of got burnt out, um, Zoom fatigue, whatever you want to call it. So right now I'm not doing that. Um, but I have um, some workshops ahead and um, some plenary events. And yeah. And, and those are listed on terrymira.com? They will be soon. All right. All right, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to learn more about Terry Muir's magnificent work and study with a true master, uh, go over to his website. Uh, it's been a joy having you here, Terry. It's You're just inspirational to me. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank thank you. Watching, fascinated for the last 20 minutes. Um, <laughs> but uh, a one, one bit of housekeeping before we go away. 
Um, just want to say, Kay Sneva, if you're watching out there, you are going to get the copy of Ala Prima next. Uh, I've contacted Crow Johnson. You and she will be, we'll figure out how to do the handoff. I think she'll be sending it down to you. Um, and then you get it for a month and then we'll send it off to somebody else. Um, that's enough housekeeping. Terry, thank you so, so much for joining us. Will I see you at uh, Forgotten Coast? Yes, I'll be doing Forgotten Coast and the Planner South as well this, this time around. And oh, wow. if you're going to be at Door, I'll see you there too. Excellent, excellent. Those of you out there who um, are anywhere near the Florida Panhandle, Forgotten Coast Plein Air in Apalachicola is one of the best Plein Air events in the country. And Terry and I can be found at the Owl Tap Room uh, most at the end of most painting days, having a plate of uh, well, you do oysters, but I do the shrimp, uh, and having a couple of excellent local pale ales. Excellent, uh, yes. It's been a joy talking with you, Terry. You take good care. And thank you. We'll thank you for having me. Road. This was great. Bye bye. Bye bye.